we want to welcome everyone to the 2021 legislative wrap session. We know some people are still trickling in. There are some people who can only um, join us online, so we thank you for being here. Um, feel free to drop your questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, we want to thank Up the Vault 901 for partnering with Sister Reach and also the Equity Alliance. So first, we will hear from Kendra Lee, um, who is in the Policy Department at the Equity Alliance. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, thank you to Sister Reach for hosting a wonderful event for us to be able to really recap um, a lot that's going on. And I know that I have the experts behind me um, state legislators, but as you know, um, the Equity Alliance founded in 2016 and really used to be a space um, to create electoral power uh, for black and brown communities, and one of those ways we want to be able to make sure to do that outside of the election season is really holding our elected officials accountable and being able to keep up with what's happening during the legislative session, um, and I, I'll try to be quite brief about the things that are happening. Um, as we were aware, um, there were tons of events that were happening. We got some great laws passed in our legislative session. Um, we got some not so great things passed as well, but I do think that the most important thing that we can be able to let you all know is that we had an amazing group of individuals um, across the state of Tennessee who worked collectively to really just make sure that everyone was informed. Uh, whether things were happening in the committee, whether things were happening in the state house, whether things were happening in the state senate, um, everyone was there to be able to show their support. Um, whether we were there to make sure that we had opposition about the anti-protester bill or other things that were happening within our session, uh, we stayed strong and we stayed together to be able to make sure that our voices were heard. And at the end of the day, that's really what matters. Um, and what I, I said again, that I'll leave a lot of the more technical things to our actual state legislators who will be up shortly. Um, but I do want to be able to say that now our next focus is about redistricting. Uh, we know that we have a very important midterm and gubernatorial race that is coming up. We know that we're going to be able to have the redistricting process and we'll be able to start looking to get information to come in around August or September of this year. And then by statute, have those things completed by January 2022. Uh, we want to make sure that there is as much community input and transparency as possible. Um, I don't know if a lot of you recall, but a lot of the changes that we've seen, a lot of the power with our super majorities across our nation happened when the district changed in 2010. So we want to make sure that we don't make that same mistake twice. We want to make sure that the transparency is there. We want to be able to make sure that we do that gerrymandering at all angles. And for us to be able to do that, we really have to take a collective interest within the redistricting process from start to finish. Um, we know that there was a huge push for the census data, and once that data comes out, it will show us what our neighborhoods look like and how we should have representation. And so we want to be able to make sure that the census was the first step, and now we have to continue to see it through when we talk about redistricting. Um, so I did want to be able to put that on your radar for us to be able to make sure that we're doing the work. Uh, we are extremely focused and we are excited about what we have coming up in 2022. Um, and thank you so much again to Sister Reach um, for allowing us to collaborate on this legislative session. Thank you so much, Kim. Now, before we go any further, um, we'd like to inform you that we did invite um, elected officials from our Tennessee State House of Representatives, our Tennessee State Senate, our City Council, as well as our County Commission and our School Board members. Um, we extended the invite to everyone. You can always see a hand for you, but um, we are going to make the most of it, and we have several of our bodies represented and we still have more on the way. Um, I will let you know that some did say, you know, they may be out of town. Um, a few had some personal ailments, but we are going to get started with who's in-house. So first, what I would like to hear from our elected officials is please introduce yourself, your body of government, the district you represent, and how long you serve in government. 
We'll start with our Tennessee State Senators, followed by our Tennessee State Representatives and our City Councilors. So Sarah Kyle, we'll get started with you. connection with us. It really encouraged us, teed us up, and gave us input. And uh, thank you. I am Sarah Kyle. Uh, I'm one of six Democratic state senators that serve in the state senate. I am three of us from Memphis, three of us from National. I represent North Memphis, Raleigh, Frazier, up in Jerry Manor, different pieces of the city. But it is a pleasure to work with my colleagues, and I want to thank Sister Red for having us today. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Senator Katrina Robinson. I represent Tennessee uh, State District 33 in the Tennessee State Senate. Uh, that includes everything from the airport to Parry Hill, including Parkway Village, Green Hill, Orange Mound, Southeast Memphis, East Memphis, parts of Berman County, and Parry Hill. I've been in the Senate since 2019. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am State Representative Karen Kemper, House District 87. My district sits in Senator Robinson's district. We actually have been serving since 2018, which actually got elected. Uh, it takes me into Whitehaven, Oak Haven, Parkway Village, Cross Meadows, and Little Hickory Hill, and swing up to the Lone Acre. I've been serving since 2008, and I am a House Minority. As you can see, we have various bodies of government that represent our city and county reflected here. What we want to know is how do you each navigate building relationships with elected officials that you don't directly serve with? So for example, as a state representative, how do you communicate with a city council person? Or for state senators, how do you communicate with the city council person and vice versa to make sure that your respective community Thank you for the question, Karen. I, I actually think that's one of the most important things to do as a legislator because we're so far from our districts during our legislative session and we need to have ears and eyes on the ground. So I try to keep an open line of communication with those whose uh, districts overlap with mine, including uh, Representative Campbell, who's there with me, but also. Uh, city council people like Warren or um, our county commissioners. Uh, for example, when there was an issue in Hickory Hill with um, some illegal dumping, I had to make a call to the city council person because a lot of times our constituents don't really know where to reach out to to get certain things handled. And so I was able to call the city council person to make sure that they heard our needs and got it addressed immediately. So I, I think it's all about keeping an open line of communication and being cognizant of those who actually represent the district within your work. Delegation and we meet um, for the public. We hear uh, local thoughts and 
county government about issues that they're going to be putting forward that we can work with them, responsible for them at the state level, and they reciprocate with us. Uh, I think we have a great relationship with um, our county and city, and I really appreciate your work with um, on both of you today. You're the best, right? So thank you, and Dr. Swan, you have been a stellar representative to the community, and it's been good. I think my colleagues have given a pretty good idea about all the general ways that we do this, but let me give a couple of specifics of how this sort of works and it may make more sense. Uh, I received a call from uh, one of my friends, the principal at the Cedar K-8 school in uh, Southwest Memphis, and he had an idea for a program to benefit two and three-year-olds uh, and pay family members to put their kids in a specific educational program that's led by a licensed teacher. Uh, so I started thinking about how to do this, and I called uh, uh, Representative uh, Mark White, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, Representative Mark London and Representative, Representative Chisholm from that area on a conference call discussing this concept, seeing how we possibly could get funding 
from the Tennessee program, I think it's called PHNF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. So there's about $730-$740 million in that program that hasn't been spent. So this past week, on a conference call, we had our first conference call on how do we approach this. And uh, Representative White's going to be taking this to the governor. The other representatives are going to be taking it to their leadership. So uh, Representative Camper's going to be hearing about this. And uh, the Senate leadership will be hearing about this also. So what we're hoping to do is to capitalize on those state funds. In the meantime, as the city government representative, my research assistant, has figured out there, is, there are clauses in this relief bill from the Biden administration that may also help provide. So we're looking at specific ways to try to help. And what this does by providing families $500 payment for having their children in school for two years, it relieves a significant amount of the burden of critical abject poverty that people live under and allows children to have less adverse childhood events because there's not the same stress in the household. Uh, kids are going to go to daycare because the family's getting money for it. And this daycare is more than just being babysat. Actually, it's getting these kids ready that by the time they get kindergarten, they're at grade level, they're not behind coming up. So by third grade, they're reading. And so it's similar to this is Congressman Cohen assisting us and the council as we're trying to get things stopped in the Alien Pipeline and going through uh, Foxville. Uh, that still process is going on. Representative Hartline, who just joined us in this space. Um, and the next question is Many of you have eleva elevated positions in your respective area of service. By this, we mean each year a committee or hold a leader position. Share what your elevated position is and how it influences the rest of your leadership. Sure. Many of you have elevated positions in your respective area of service. By this, we mean you chair a committee or hold a leader position. For example, um, Representative Camper is minority house leader. For those wearing additional hats, meaning you chair a committee or serve a leader position, share what your elevated position of service is and how it influences your leadership. Thank you for that question. Uh, it is important to understand the different leadership roles that we find ourselves in and the expectation that not only our members have of us, but the community at large. So I have served as, I served in several uh, positions over the years. I served as the chair of the Sheva County Delegation, we talked about before, uh, and working within our um, the other kind of delegation to make sure that the issues that are, are important at the county level that come before us, that members are working together to help achieve those goals. Sometimes we have to vote on them and make sure that we are fighting in Nashville to make sure that what Nashville is doing, what that's just going, we can achieve in Nashville. We have to work across party lines to get that done with it and, and try to hold it, keep the delegation together. I guess challenging, but we need to to do it and navigate it. I'm sure Chair Hardaway can talk a little bit more about that. Oh, he's been, he served a little longer than I have. Uh, right now, I serve as an House Majority Leader. So I am pretty much the number one Democrat, if you will, uh, in the House in terms of making sure our agenda is passed. We have members who are trying to get things done for that district. But there are still ways to get it done. We have to figure out how to maneuver within the, uh, with the state to build. So we still have to try to work across party lines to get other members to have an open mind to hear what it is they're talking about. And so part of what can help, you know, a little on that because he serves in committees where sometimes when you read your members, 
even though they're of different parties from you or different ideologies from you, they understand what you're trying to do. So we've been very, you know, keen on trying to get things done on uh, the House side and both of them in the Senate. So leadership has to help our members navigate, maneuver, work across, across party lines to achieve our goals to get our bills passed and make sure that our constituents are getting, you know, the, the desire As a leader, I have to work with the administration a lot. So I have to meet with the governor and his team a lot based on his you know, Are you looking at the wish, wants, and desires of every citizen in this state and not just what you do regarding? So I work with the governor's uh, team and all his leadership, all of the department uh, commissioners, and uh, agency directors. And well, as my caucus, trying to hold them together and then work so hard in that. So it gets challenging, but it is it's possible to get things done. And, 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 and if you do the thing you have to do as a leader, is know, understand, and appreciate the value that your team has. So I need to send somebody like a part of way who's gonna, you know, really put them in shape. I have to know. His knowledge, skills, expertise, and allow him to be that for us. We may need somebody else. So the leader has to understand that to be able to leverage that to help us move our agenda. Uh, what the policy 
uh, through the rules, the policy, through the, the legislative process, the law. Where does the key want for your constituents? Once I figure that out, I can figure out how to do uh, what I need to do to help them and to help my constituents so that everybody wins. Anybody has to do this legislatively, uh, Lita will tell you we work hard to pass legislation that improves the quality of life for our constituents. We don't fight uh, deals just to be fighting them, we fight them to make them better deals. And we don't mind you passing deals, we just wanted to do something uh, good for our folks. And so, uh, with that said, I do uh, Lita that. The most important thing is being a good team player, understanding and appreciating the diversity of the field, whether it's through gender, whether it's through uh, race, whether it's through geography, um, and other experiences. You got to know people. Thank you. Every year, legislation, ordinances, and resolutions to clarify, it seems there are issues that seem to get more spotlight or awareness than others. What determines which issues are lifted more or, or pushed further down the priorities?
we're learning how to make all these pieces go together, but we're trying to learn very rapidly. And the only way you can learn is by listening to our council, like our council, our, our representatives behind us. Thank you. Besides a conflict of professional interests, what would cause you to abstain from a vote or to be counted as PNP, which stands for present not voting? And this question is for everyone.
Please be grateful for that you're not going. Well, this reason for the whole presence is not going to based on their respective districts. And I I believe that our district sent us there to represent their voice, their views, and what they stand for. And so that was the one time my district was evenly divided and I was present and not voting. I just want to echo Representative Hardaway and Leader Campbell. I think it's, it's more of a personal uh, decision whether you have a state to vote. We all have our different reasons as to whether we would vote present or not voting or a state to vote. But most times it's going to be where there's an issue, and Dr. Warren, I'm sure you can attest to this, where you cannot properly assess the benefits outweigh the risks. And, and, and literally, when we're making these decisions on the Capitol, we're doing it on behalf of our representatives, 200,000 constituents. If there's an issue that I, I feel like my district would be divided on, just like I would put a 10%, I may have the same time. But it's very, very rare that I do that because I, I want to decide to stand based on what my constituents have trusted me to do. Um, and a lot of things go into this. I mean, y'all are tough crowds. This week, the crowd is a tough crowd. We'll take it down. So, um, you know, and then sometimes you all are not privy to the details of legislation. That has happened along the process of getting that legislation, whether it's to the committee or to the court. So I'm more apt to um, abstain from voting in a committee than I was before. Only because it's a smaller setting, there's things that happen in committee that you kind of have to assess your political capital um, to see if it's worth voting no against. And sometimes you have to say, Thank you very much for your question. Um, in the State Senate, a lot of times there will be issues that I will present myself from the chairman's committee or talk to the bill. I will not be voting for this bill. This is why. The reason is for your family connection, a business connection. I'm certainly a certain book. Uh, my family, I've got a first cousin, Judge Frank Leonard, serves as a judge. And that's family. And I would not be voting on a bill that would affect his um, school. In business, uh, for example, for me, I have a brother who has a storage unit. It was a bill that concerned all students at storage units. Um, I would go to sponsor because my brother owns storage units. I would not be voting on that particular bill. But if you have um, or social,
Talk a bit about structure and what voting looks like. Now we want to get into some of the issues. The next question, are you familiar with the term reproductive justice? If so, what are you doing to support and advance it? If not, make me an educated guess, what do you think it means? Are you familiar with the term reproductive justice? If so, what are you doing to support and advance it? If not, making an educated guess, what do you think it means? So my interpretation of reproductive justice is um, the protection of women's rights as it relates to social economic uh, inequities. So basically, what happens for black women in certain spaces doesn't necessarily happen for white women. We have a higher uh, rate of infant mortality and maternal mortality than any other racial group. Um, and so reproductive justice takes into account what we do to accommodate those issues in our communities, what we do to uh, improve those outcomes in our communities. Uh, one thing that I try to do is work hand in hand with independent organizations. So I'm sponsoring an event next month uh, with a doula, also a um, obstetrician. It's called Old Baby. And so we're going to do uh, basically prenatal health care education as well as some. Yoga, basically educating our community on the things that can improve those outcomes. And a lot of times in our legislature, it can be a daunting task to do that because, because we have such an overwhelming uh, population that does not agree with reproductive justice and does not support it. Um, and so our, our primary tactic is to, is to fight against those things on the floor and through process of legislation. Um, of course, we all know that we've had some issues with uh, those across the aisle. Mechanisms and programs that will help women make their decisions and be able to take care of their children and their families. And so reproductive justice for me means, do I have the same chance of survival and thriving as the person next to me because of the black man?
but at the same time we have these life events, uh, very poor legislation that was put to women. Yeah, so uh, as Senator um, Kyle mentioned, we do pass bills that support uh, those women who are incarcerated to have proper health care uh, as it relates to different hygiene, uh, preventative health care. Last session, or actually last, yeah, last session, I sponsored a bill that required us to uh, provide feminine hygiene products and health care products to women who are incarcerated. Uh, you would think that that's just a given, but it's not. A woman has to work 26 hours or report a box of tampons in prison. Um, Senator uh, Kyle also sponsored some legislation that provided mammograms for those who are incarcerated. And so you're basically addressing the issues that we can address given the supermajority that's in the legislature. Um, but there's so much more work to do, and a lot of it, a lot of it resides and starts with systems programs and organizations like yours that piece the, the puzzle together for us. Representative Jeannie Richardson had a 
bill every year was always someone had a bill trying to tamper this issue. Uh, Sherry Jones had a bill. So we will, I believe, I believe that it's time for us to move forward and do what God created on this earth, which is a plant that has a good look to it, but us to move forward. The other thing that I want to is African American people need to be ready to be a part of whatever it is when it's finally gets to a point where it's going to happen in this state. So we're not kind of out of her and saying, I think we're left out again. So we got to get on the issue. We got to get on the issue and say, what does the taxing look like? How does that money go into? things that we care about, what is the economic impact or driver going to be, and how do we get in front of that and be a part of that? So there's a lot of nuances and things that need to take place before this happens. Yes, I support it, and yes, I believe we have got to be involved right now, because I believe the college is going to happen. I've already, you know, done it, and I was thinking around with it. Okay. So we need to be ready. Yes, I support how uh, the responsible uh, rollout for medical marijuana. I support it because the science, medical research, supports it. So I support and follow the science. And it's a matter now of trying to get those who, and I hate to be them, I don't hate to call it out and have the whole hope. But as soon as they find out how to make money, how to position themselves, and as soon as the, uh, the state government and federal government have figured out how to position themselves uh, economically to tax the cities, you're going to see it rolled out nationally. So right now, we're playing games. We've got gimmicks in terms of rules and regulations and enforcement, but uh, it's out there, uh, it's, uh, it's real. The offset to medical marijuana and then moving the needle uh, if the legislature uh, saw fit and the community supported it to be real criminal justice. Thank you for this question. I do support medical marijuana. I support recreational marijuana. I support the criminalization of marijuana. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> but the only thing is, uh, and, and to, to their merit, uh, both President Carway and uh, Leader Kemper, the holdup is how do we monetize this and make it beneficial? Um, and I've, I've studied some of the requirements, the licensing requirements in other states, and some of them are designed to keep the African American community out of qualifying to be qualifying growers in the dispensaries. And I think that's one thing we have to be careful with in Tennessee because we're steadily buying time to get this programming right, but really there is an underlying uh, agenda to make it only benefit the community that they want it to benefit. And so if we're going to see Justice reform, like Mr. Hardaway said, if we're going to see real things happen with marijuana for the African American community to uh, uh, help us out with just as it relates to those who are unduly incarcerated for marijuana possession, we have to be careful and be involved in every step of the way as we move towards that. There are so many states around us that are uh, adopting this that I think that we are not too far off from Tennessee's own anyway, but I don't think we're too far off of getting here, so we have to be very, very careful not to miss this because that is kind of the, the MO in our legislation is being seen under the radar and all of a sudden we're arguing about the two o'clock in the morning last year's session, so thank you. Yeah, I'm just saying, they pay my bills. Yes, of course. Let me tell you, people don't think about if you're 
You come to visit the state of Tennessee. It's legal to bring in your heart meds, your heart medicine, your diabetic medicine, your allergy medicine. And we're trying to make it that um, if you live in another state, you want to visit our state, and you have a, um, a legal right to be using medical marijuana, and we want you to be able to do that in this state. Here's even some proposal things. If you live in Arkansas, just right across the bridge, but you work in Memphis, you may be taking the medical marijuana for certain conditions. And you should not be penalized to be coming to Tennessee for bringing you that medicine. Yes, you know, for uh, recreational marijuana, we call it decriminalized. And that's what we're trying When you hear the words critical race theory, what do you begin to think and why do you determine that it is so controversial? You know, there, earlier you asked us how things become a priority, like you all of a sudden start to hear these buzzwords and everything. And I think critical race theory is a perfect example of that. Um, last legislative session, I never heard that. This legislative session all of a sudden is a hot buzz for it to be on everybody's legislative survey they send to their constituents on the other side. Um, and that comes from organizations um, that pretty much send prepackaged legislation to uh, other representatives, which is what they push. It's like for this one that we didn't touch on earlier. So you have organizations like Alan that will send you, this is what we want you to push this 
year, and they bring it about. Uh, Senate Bill 1101 was not there. I think I talked to Sister Reach uh, uh, constituencies about that maybe a few months ago. And my bill was to enhance black history education for our children in both fifth and eighth grade. Not confine it to fifth and eighth grade, but make an expansive education in those grades because they were transitional grades. I got so much pushback on that. So much pushback on that from the other side of the aisle. But no one can give me a logical reason why it's not feasible to expand black history education for our students. We make time to teach them everything else. Black history is just going to be included in their history lesson in fifth and eighth grade, talking to students Tennessee history. Um, and so they killed the bill. After they made out a committee, we made out a committee of these six to get a pad, pressing that button, and then got to the floor, and the vote was, I think, 14, 2, and 16. Yeah, they, they buried it on the floor. And they did it in a manner in which they could not be held accountable for because of how um, procedures go in the city. And only to find out the reason why that was killed was because there was a critical race theory agenda coming at the very end of the session. So critical race theory is this phenomenon that originated in post-secondary education that basically details how our socioeconomic status is determined, how our um, uh, education is determined, and basically assigns not necessarily the plane, but it identifies the pathways of how we got there. And so the, the bill that was passed on the floor in relation to critical race theory basically banned transparent and accurate education uh, as it concerns anything that was oppressive to the black community or African American community or even minorities altogether. Um, and I think that was just one of the most disheartening moments I've ever experienced uh, in my service, is to know that I'm one of three black women who serve in the Senate, and you don't think my history is relevant. You don't think the history of our children is relevant. Um, and, and it's not just me. We serve so many other people in this, in this state, in this county, in this city, who really don't know where we where we come from. And part of us mending those those bridges, um, for lack of a better term, is everyone being educated as to why we are here, how slavery has evolved into a prison system, how um, how crimes against black people have gone from lynching to now police shootings. We need to understand the history of that so that there is there is, there are productive conversations that happen. There is effective legislation that happens because if we don't respect the history, we will never get to where we need to get to to resolve those issues between our race and this country. I just want to add real quick, and um, let's talk about what Alex is. A L E C, the American Legislative Exchange Council. That is the far right wing. You may have heard of Coach Brothers. They've always supported this type of organization. This critical race theory bill is the most harmful and hateful and disgusting bill we have heard. Of course, it's going to have a chilling effect. What it's going to do is prepare I would tell you, if I was a betting person, this bill will go into the courts and it will be dismissed. But by now, the Republican right wing has scared another scare tactic in the community. I will be doing everything I can to fight this, and I want to thank Senator Wilson. She gave an outstanding speech. She already talked. She does its power, and she just had us all sitting back. And if you don't want that from her speech on the Senate floor, I think it would help me better understand what we're facing. Thank you. Um, the time critical rate of theory actually has been around a long time. It started in the 70s, 
And it was looking at structural racism and white supremacy and the effects that it had, had on US and African countries. And so, fast forward to now, where we had a black man become the president of this country, in which this country has said, you can do whatever you want as long as you work hard for it, and he did, and won twice. There were still some people that had a problem with that. So this race consciousness started you know, moving people. And there were people saying, oh, we're colorblind now because Barack Obama is the president. We're past the racial tension. But not really, because it awakened something in some people in this country. Secondly, behind him immediately was a President Trump, who now is empowering people that had a problem with the immediate past president, Barack Obama. So, what I believe is America is coming face to face with itself, based on who we say we are and who we actually are. So in a democratic society, we say, you have access to this. You can do that. The laws favor everybody. But we all live and know that that is really not true. So we're fighting for that democracy to exist and give us full participation in it, but everybody don't want you to have it. Everybody don't want you to have that full participation in democracy. And this, this coming face-to-face with ourselves is challenging because now, if you've been living in denial about who America has said it is toward its citizens, and now you have been awakened to that, maybe your conflict is bothering you. I don't know. Think about a George Floyd last year. Think about a George Floyd in a pandemic year. Well, we're not hustling and bustling and moving and going to work and doing all this. We're at home. We're watching. We're seeing what's happening in our country. So a lot of people got more involved in their democracy and began to learn that hmm, maybe we're not as democratic as we're telling the world we are. So there's a face to face here with America. You can look at the election of a donor. And how many people voted for the two candidates? They were reckoning. And so this critical race theory, what it does in looking at structural racism, which is now apparently is a bad word in the general assembly, because there are people that don't believe it. But there are some of us who know the race. So I believe America had to get to this point. But we had to take a look at ourselves, where our consciousness needed to be awakened. Because if you awaken your consciousness, then it's going to require you to do something. And I think we're seeing now what is happening and what people are doing. And I agree, Alex probably said the way but it's not a new philosophy. It's just been brought to the forefront because of what we've been through historically over the last few years. That's my view. Yeah, uh, you know, this is about the truth. This is about a, this is about whether you want to know history and the facts in context. This is about the truth. Too many times we hear white nationalism, white uh, supremacy, 
preaching us indoctrinated uh, into our children as the truth. And when you look at the scholarly work of individuals in the, in the study of uh, the area of critical race theory, you can look at multi-generational trauma or intergenerational uh, trauma. It's all the same thing. It's about how this country was started, how it prospered, how it sustained itself, at the expense of black folks, those of, uh, of Asian descent, and Native Americans. Now, the fear and the opposition against critical race theory is because they want that black nationalism to continue to dominate the academic. They want that to be what you study. Uh, myself, for instance, and I'm sure uh, my, uh, my colleagues have been taught more black history at home, in the church, at events, cultural events, than we have in all of our local schools. What do we want with critical race theory? We want to be able to talk about and understand systemic racism. We want to understand how this very constitution that created our nation broke black folk out as equal partners even though we shared that first drop of blood in the American Revolution. So critical race theory is a threat to white nationalism, white supremacy, to those who want communities of color to remain invisible. It's not about whether they want to uh, tell the story of uh, communities of color, they don't want to tell your story unless they put you in the context they want to be in, which is one where you don't get the dignity and don't carry the pride of your folks when they were stolen from Africa and murdered uh, in the transition and, and uh, chose to jump into those watery graves uh, in the middle past, how they were brutalized and tortured. How the Jim Crow era perpetuated that same white supremacism and allowed those same lazy folks who had an unsustainable business model called slavery, which incorporated free labor, how it didn't work then, how sharecropping didn't work afterwards, and how some of the economic uh, 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 systems that they want us to abide uh, to today. They don't work either, but it's about keeping you ignorant of your past, keeping other folks ignorant of the contributions of communities of color, and as Thomas Jefferson said, any nation in a civilized state that wants to be ignorant and free wants what never will, never was, and never will be. We are going to take a 15 minute break to allow people to have a bio break and grab something to eat. And we will be back here around between 2.13 and 2.15. 